Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, we continue the course called Physics for Teens and today we will start a new part. Um, it's called Waves. So it's basically about different kinds of waves. Mechanical waves, electromagnetic waves, whatever. Um, uh, electromagnetism, which was the previous uh, part of this course, is basically finished. I mean, theoretical material is finished. Uh, maybe I will return with some maybe more problems or something like this. Exams, I'm not sure. But anyway, we start the waves. Now, this course is presented on unizor.com website um, together with a prerequisite course which is called Math for Teens. Um, now, all the materials on the website are totally free. There are no ads no strings attached, so you're welcome to take the whole course, actually, uh, if you, by some chance, by a search engine or whatever, you, you came to this lecture on YouTube or any other uh, website, well, obviously, you're welcome to watch it as much as you want, um, but the unizor.com um, has the whole functionality of the course, which means lectures are logically related to each other. Each lecture has a textual description, basically notes, like a textbook. Um, so I do suggest you to use unizor.com as your main uh, gateway to this course and all lectures of it. There are some menus, obviously, etc. So, let's talk about waves now. Uh, we will start with mechanical waves. First of all, mechanics is about movements, right? So, um, certain movements have a property of repeating itself, repetitive movements. Now, what kind of repetitive movements? I have a few examples like carousel, for instance, when it's rotating. Um, the pendulum, whenever the pendulum is going back and forth. Or, I have an interesting example, a tuning fork. You know, uh, it's called cameratone sometimes. Whenever somebody wants to tune up the piano, for instance, they're using this tuning fork. They hit it against some hard um, object and then it sounds specific note. So for every note there is a special tuning fork. So as it vibrates, uh, it makes mechanical uh, movements um, the legs of this tuning fork and obviously they are repetitive to a degree obviously now um, in some cases we can have a high degree of repetition so for example if the clock has a pendulum um, while it's wound up the pendulum is moving really repetitively to a high degree because that's the measurement of the time, like one second per one particular movement back and forth or something like this. Sometimes movements kind of seem repetitive, but they're still kind of changing. Tuning fork, well, whenever you hit it, it starts vibrating, but then the vibrating is uh, getting um, a little bit less and less. The amplitude is diminishing, although the frequency remains. So the time of repetitive movement is maintained, but the amplitude is getting smaller. So it's not exactly repetitive movement, but to a degree during certain um, relatively short period of time you can say that this is a true repetitive movement. Now, uh, sometimes the repetition is made <coughs> in, in different um, periods of time. For instance, when the carousel is getting um, faster and faster, is rotating faster and faster, it's doing the repetitive movement. However, um, the time during the, uh, it makes a circle is actually diminishing when it speeds up or when it slows down the time gets uh, greater, the time of one repetition. So basically we are talking about 
certain period of time during which the repetition is occurring. Now, the first very important is we can talk about periodic movement. Periodic movement is when this period of time when um, the object makes this repetitive movement is constant. So the carousel is making repetitive movement when it reaches its maximum speed and rotates during uh, its works. While it's speeding up or slowing down, it's not truly repetitive movement. Um, I mean, it's repetitive, but uh, the, the time is changing. And we have a special, um, another special word, periodic movement. Periodic movement is more um, when this time is maintained as a constant. Okay, so uh, when time of one full circle is constant, we are talking about periodic movement. Okay, what's next? Okay, let's talk about mm, mass just a little bit. The object uh, in our three-dimensional world world is characterized by three coordinates, right? And if we are talking about movement, we are talking about all three coordinates being functions of time, right? And all three coordinates together, they are making a point in a three-dimensional world, right? We can actually say that this is a three-dimensional function of time, assuming that we have three different functions inside it. So, um, what is a periodic movement? Periodic movement is that exist t constant such that p of t is equal to p of t plus t for any moment of time t. So this is a true periodic movement. And obviously we were talking about this in the course called Mass for Teens when I introduced the concept of periodic function. Well, function which we were talking about was usually a function which was a one-dimensional function. In this case it's a three-dimensional function, which means it's a three functions. So basically what this means, it means that x of t uh, plus plus t equals x of t y of t plus capital T is equal to y of t and z of t plus t equals z of t that's what it means this means this when p is a three-dimensional function so this is a mathematical definition of periodic movement. Okay, we are still kind of approaching the concept of waves and to basically approach it the way how it's usually done, we have to introduce the concept of periodic movement. Because waves are periodic movements of something, of some, some substance, right? So that's why I started from these well, I would say more theoretical um, than, than, than practical aspects. You, you might think about waves as waves on the surface of the water. So let's just not talk about concrete waves, uh, because they can be in, in, in sound, for instance, it's air uh, um, uh, oscillations and, and some others. Electromagnetic uh, field, the light, it's also waves, it's all waves. So, in any case, we start with mechanical movement, which we can char characterize as periodic movement, and that was the definition of the periodic movement. Now, when we're talking about waves, you know, back and forth, back and forth, uh, we are talking about specific periodic movement. When the object we are observing, whether it's a uh, a drop of water or something like this. It's doing periodic movement, but not just any periodic movement. 
carousel is a periodic movement, but it just goes round and round. Pendulum is a different kind of periodic movement because it goes along the same trajectory but in different directions, back and forth, back and forth. So that's the difference. Carousel is making <coughs> movements only in one direction. Pendulum, both directions. So we're talking about a concept called oscillation. Okay, oscillation is a periodic movement, of course, but not just any periodic movement. It's such a periodic movement when the object we are talking about is moving along the same trajectory in one direction, goes to an extreme point, then turns back and goes along the same trajectory to another extreme point, and then back and forth, back and forth. So this periodic movement is called oscillation. Now, <coughs> what's important about oscillation is that we always need external force. Now, if you have somewhere in the space, you have a carousel which somehow was turned um, and it's rotating right now, you don't need any more external forces for the carousel to continue uh, spinning around its axis. If there are no gravity, no, no, no other forces, it still will be rotating by inertia. If we are talking about oscillation, we cannot avoid existence of the forces. Why? Well, since we have one direction, then it should slow down and then it should speed up again back into an uh, opposite direction. So we are changing the speed, which means there is an acceleration, which means there is a force. Without the force, uh, this particular object would continue moving along a straight line um, with the same speed without any kind of restriction. So we need the force to slow it down, stop, and then uh, speed it up again into a different direction, and then back and back and forth all the time. So we always have the force. Oscillation cannot occur without the force. It may be gravity, it may be something else, but there is always the force. Okay, that's important. What's next? Um, the next is there is a special position um, where the uh, if, if there is no force, basically, uh, then there is a special position, this particular object, um, which makes uh, uh, oscillation, would, would not move. It, it's a, a middle point. It's a, it's a point of equilibrium, basically. So, um, if the force is not actually acting on such, a, such an object, it would just stay in the equilibrium point. So we need the force to start the movement and all the time to maintain the movement back and forth. We need these forces. Without the force, it would just be in, the, in one particular uh, position, which is an equilibrium point, a neutral position. And the obvious example, which we always use, is if you have a spring and some kind of an object. Now, I um, draw it horizontally because I don't want um, the gravity to interfere with elasticity of the, um, of the spring. So, consider this is in, in space, when there is no gravity, okay? So, if this is in space and uh, this is a movement along some kind of a, I don't know, you can have it like a string, for instance, but there is no friction here. So the whole string, it goes through the spring and then through some kind of a midpoint of this spherical object um, along its uh, diameter, but there is no friction, okay? So it goes back and forth um, without any friction. 
the spring always has some neutral position. So if we are in a neutral position and no forces are um, acting on this particular object, it will basically stay still. That's an equilibrium point. Neutral point for the spring. It's not stretched and it's not squeezed. It's a neutral point. Okay. Now, if we apply certain force and let's say stretch it to this position. Now the spring is stretched and as we know whenever the spring is stretched there is a force which brings it back into a neutral position, right? So it will bring it back and then by inertia it will go and squeeze the spring and then it will reach certain maximum and then back and forth, back and forth. So that's how our object will move. And I would like to basically investigate this particular movement. We already did this in mechanical part, but it's important I will repeat this thing because this is basically the beginning of how we deal with waves. All right, so um, we are talking right now about special type of oscillation. It's called harmonic as oscillation. So the, the characteristic point of harmonic oscillation is sinusoidal movement and let me explain what sinusoidal in this particular case means sometimes harmonic oscillation uh, is defined as oscillation which is uh, characterized by the force uh, proportional to um, displacement from the equilibrium point so this is a displacement and we know the Hooke's law, right? Remember Hooke's law? That the force, that the force is proportional, this is the coefficient of proportionality, to a displacement, which is distance from the equilibrium point. So the further we, we, we stretch it, the stronger the force is, and it's proportional to this distance. Where k is just a characteristic of the spring, it's called coefficient of elasticity of this spring. There are stronger springs, obviously, and obviously this particular coefficient is greater. There are weak strings, etc. But this is what's important. Now, x is not just x. x is x of t function of time, right? Because we're talking about movement. So the x is the difference, basically. This is 0. This is x-axis. Uh, and, uh, and this is x of t. So first, we stretch this particular spring to certain distance, initial distance, a. So x of 0 is equal to a initially at moment time t is equal to 0 we stretch it to a this is a and we let it go which means we don't really push it or pull it into any other direction which means that the speed which is the first derivative at point zero, at point time equal to zero, is equal to zero. So we're just, we stretch it to the distance A from the equilibrium and let it go. So there is no initial speed. The initial speed is zero, basically. But the force is acting, so there is certain acceleration. Now, what is acceleration? Well, remember this. Mass times acceleration, this is the second Newton's law. So we have two, two different things. We have this. Now what is acceleration? Acceleration, as we know, is the second derivative of time. Second derivative, the, if, if x of t is distance from zero as a function of time, the first derivative is uh, speed, the second uh, derivative is acceleration. Again, if you don't remember these little things, you really have to go to mechanics of this course, Physics for Teens. 
and whatever I'm going to do next would be related to derivatives and uh, differential equation. And again, I can always refer you back to uh, the prerequisite course called Mass for Teens on the same website. There is a very um, uh, big calculus chapter over there, and in particular, we were dealing with differential equations. So, these two things, this and this, allow us to make a differential equation this is F and this is F. It's exactly the same force, right? But in this case, we are relating the force to Hooke's law, and in this case, it's a Newton's law. But both are true. It's exactly the same force, which means that M times X second derivative of time is equal to minus K X of T. Or X second derivative equals to k divided by m x of t. Okay, this is a differential equation which has certain solution. Actually, there are many solutions, as I will show you, to this particular equation. But out of many solutions, we will choose only one which satisfies these initial conditions. Okay, so what about solutions to this? Again, I can refer you back to um, uh, calculus and differential equations of the course called Mass for Teens, but I will just very kind of briefly uh, repeat something which you um, should 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 really know. You see, this is the first, der uh, the second derivative, and the function itself. Now, if you remember uh, calculus, there are two trigonometric functions: sine and cosine, which have second derivative actually looking very much, well, considering some coefficients, uh, like original function, because the uh, sine um, derivative is cosine, and cosine derivative is minus sine. So the second derivative is derivative of the first derivative, which is derivative of the cosine, which is minus sine. And second derivative of a cosine. First derivative is minus sine, so we have minus derivative of sine cosine. So as you see, function is the same, just the coefficient minus here. We have a very similar kind of situation here. So we might uh, look for a solution as a combination of two functions. Oh, by the way, if instead of t I will put something like um, uh, p times t or omega times t, it will be exactly the same thing because the coefficient will be on both sides. So we definitely have a little bit more general solution here. So this is um, a general form where I will look uh, for a solution to this particular problem. So, I don't know what C1, C2, and omega are, but I will look for certain C1, C2, and omega to satisfy uh, this differential equation. So, how can it be done? Well, very simply, I'll just substitute this function into this equation and find whatever the coefficient I need. Okay. So, the first derivative is equal to C1 times derivative of the cosine is minus sine. Times derivative of inner function, which is a proportionality, omega t, uh, so derivative is omega. 
plus C2, derivative of sine is a cosine times omega. Now the second derivative is minus C1, derivative of a cosine of sine is a cosine times omega and omega and derivative of inner function, so it will be omega square. Derivative of uh, cosine is minus sine and again another omega, so it will be omega square. Now, let's, con let's compare this with equation which we have. Now, this is x of t. x of t is c1, c1, cosine, cosine, c2 minus c2, sine, sine, and omega. So, as we can very simply see, and we have here minus k over m. Omega should be or omega square. Right? Omega square should be equal to k over m. Right? If omega square is equal to k over m, you have k over m here, right? And the minus sign. So now we need to uh, think about c1 and c2. So let me just put x of t is equal to c1 cosine omega is square root k over m t plus c2 sine square root k over m t. Now, what are c1 and c2? Well, let's use this one and this one. <coughs> If uh, time is equal to zero, my x should be equal to a. Now, if time is equal to zero, this is zero, sine is zero, this is zero, so cosine of zero is one. So I have basically a equals c1. x of zero is a, right? And this is one, and this is zero, so we have only c1. So this is my first. Now, the second one. Well, this is the second derivative, right? But the, I mean, the first derivative. If I will substitute 0 here, now, sine of 0 would be 0, so this will be 0. Now, this would be 1. And so the whole thing would be C2 times omega. So x of 0 is equal to C2 times omega. But I have to be equal to 0, which means C2 is supposed to be equal to 0. So this is A, and this is 0. And my final function is the function which satisfies uh, differential equation and uh, initial condition. A cosine square root k over m t. That's my function. And this is a solution of an object on a spring. So we consider this to be zero and this is initial um, position at point A from zero stretched and that's how it will um, oscillate. Okay, what's next? Two things. What is the period of this function? So what is, well, the smallest time period after which it will completely repeat its movement. Well, we know that cosine 
has a period to pi, right? How about cosine of omega t? Well, the period will be obviously 2 pi divided by omega. Why? Well, let's talk about this. Cosine of omega. So instead of t, I will put t plus this is t. So what is it? It's cosine of omega times t plus 2 pi over omega equals cosine of omega t plus 2 pi and 2 pi is obviously a period so it's cosine of omega t so this is the proof that period t is equal to 2 pi over omega and um, now the frequency well the frequency is how many oscillations this particular thing is making in one second. Well, let's just talk about this. Um, one cycle, one oscillation, it's making in T. So, one cycle in T seconds. We need frequency is certain number of cycles per second. So F cycles, it's doing in one second. So we have to find out what is F. Well, this is a proportion, obviously. So F is equal to 1 over T, which is equal to 2, sorry, omega divided by 2 pi, where omega is this, square root of K over M. Well, that's it. So this is 2 pi square root of uh, inverse. So it's m over k. And this is frequency is equal to 1 over 2 pi square root of k over m. So these are well, obviously, m is mass of our object, this one, and k is the elasticity of the spring. So these are completely physical characteristics of what we have. And based on these physical characteristics and the initial distance, and the fact that we don't push it from that initial distance, so initial speed is equal to zero, too. This is a solution, and these are two very important characteristics. This is the time during which we are making one full cycle, which means from this point it goes all the way here, squeezing the spring, and then all the way back, back to this position. And frequency is number of these oscillations per second. This is the formula. And the whole thing is about um, a simple harmonic oscillation. It's called harmonic because we are talking about sine and cosine. Well, basically, we started with harmonic oscillation as defined um, based on the proportionality of the force. At the same time, I can say actually that any um, uh, um, movement which basically can be represented as a tri trigonometric uh, function is harmonic. Because uh, uh, the, the word harmony is always related to trigonometry, <laughs> that's why. So, these are uh, basically very, very beginning um, data about uh, harmonic oscillations, and uh, obviously we will deal with harmonic oscillations all the time talking about waves. Well, that's it for today. I recommend you to read the notes for this lecture. Um, and basically that's it. Good luck. Thank you very much.